Acts 12, if you stand when you've found that. Begin reading in verse 5. Acts chapter 12, beginning reading verse 5, the Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. The angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. The Lord would help us tonight. We'd like to preach on Simon Peter's farewell. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the service this morning. Thank you, God, for your presence, Lord, for the altars that were used. Thank you, God, for the, those that have come tonight to be faithful to your house. Thank you for the songs and testimonies. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, for a few minutes to uh, share, God, what you've laid on our hearts. We ask for your Holy Spirit to help us, God, that we could be a blessing to your people, that we could lift your son up. And God, we praise that anything, God, that's said and done, Lord, that, uh, God, you would honor it. And those that have burdens here tonight, God, that they would be encouraged. Bless us with an altar service, we ask and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When we last left Simon Peter, he was in prison for now the third time. And if you recall, Herod Agrippa I was now the king. And we mentioned how uh, the Jews hated uh, Herod Agrippa I. He was aware of this, so in an attempt to try and gain some favor with them, he began to persecute the church. We read of how uh, in the beginning part of Acts chapter 12, he had already had James, the brother of John, executed. He was the first apostle to be martyred. And verse 3 tells us that uh, when Herod saw that the killing of James pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Simon Peter. So he had Simon Peter arrested. He had him thrown into prison. And by way of introduction, there were three things we pointed out in the first half of this chapter that, that we would like to mention as we conclude this uh, study tonight on the life of Simon Peter in the book of Acts. The first thing we mentioned was the protection that Herod Agrippa I had placed around Simon Peter. You may remember the last time uh, Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 5, an angel of the Lord set him and the other apostles free. And Herod Agrippa I wants to make sure nothing similar like this is going to happen on his watch. So the Bible says he ordered 16 soldiers to be assigned to guarding Simon Peter. They were divided into four sets of four. And they would rotate every six hours. And as we read at all times, two of them were chained to Simon Peter inside the cell while the other two would stand guard outside the cell. So there was the, the protection that was involved. Then secondly, we looked at the prayer that was involved in verse 5. The Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Thank God for the power of a praying church. I'm not sure there's anything that will move the heart of God and the hand of God any faster than the prayers of his people. When his church prays, he is moved. When his church prays, he takes notice. Now, the devil would like for us to believe that the time that we take here every Wednesday night as a church family to get on our knees at this old-fashioned altar, he will try to tell us that's not significant. He will try to tell us that's just a formality. That's just something that you've always done for all the years of the church's existence. But I'm here to remind you tonight, he's nothing but a liar. He knows himself that there are people here, even tonight, that have been touched by the healing hand of God. And I attribute it to one thing, that faithful group of people that come every Wednesday night and get on their knees and call out to God on behalf of those that we love. It's not just a formality. There's those that have been healed. 
There's lives that have been restored. There's marriages that have been resolved. There's unsaved loved ones that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, Hoy? Because you're something? Because I'm something? No. Because God honors the prayers and those who get on their knees and cry out to Him. He honors the prayers of His church. Samuel Chadwick said this, The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from our prayerless studies. He fears nothing from our prayerless work or our prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. And that's what the people of God are doing here in Acts chapter 12. I read a story this afternoon about a young boy who was out playing with his friends. They were having a good time and and, uh, playing games and all the things that boys do. While he was out playing, he he tripped. And when he fell on the ground, there was a, a rusted can soup can that was out in the yard and when he fell he he hit that can and it cut a deep gash in his leg they said it began to bleed bleed profusely and he held that that uh, injury that wound as tight as he could and he ran home just as fast as he could and this was many years ago before there were doctors at every corner and they would have to call the doctor out to the homes his family was poor they they couldn't afford to have extra medicines in the cabinet so they were lighting they were lighting on their mom to treat the injuries or the sicknesses they had. And most of the time, it was a home remedy. Well, they said he got home, then the mother saw the wound and she washed it, she bandaged it as best she could. She did the best she could to tend to that injury. They said within a few days, there was a discoloration of where this injury was. Infection began to sit in. So they called for the country doctor. The doctor came in and began to look at the boy's leg and he told the anxious parents, he said, I'm sorry, but this infection has spread to the bone. And we're going to have no choice but to amputate this boy's legs. And they said the mother began to weep. She said, but doctor, you don't understand. She said, you can't do that to my boy. The Lord has great plans for my son's life. And the doctor told her, he said, man, that's our only option. If we don't amputate the leg, that infection could go all over his body. It could kill him. And she said, I, I got to come back this time tomorrow. And, and I'll bring my utensils. And we're going to have to perform this surgery. This is what we got to do to save his life. Well, the mother said this. She said, well, if you're, if you're going to come back in 24 hours, that gives me 24 hours to touch heaven on my boy's behalf. They said that little mom went into that room at noon. She said, I'm not leaving out of here till God gives me an answer. They said hour after hour, she knelt by his bedside, agonizing with the Lord, begging God to heal his body. The next morning, the doctor walked in. He brought all of his utensils that were necessary to perform a leg amputation. He sat the boy down on the medical table. He rolled up his pants leg. He began to look for infection and the discoloration was gone. He began to look for swelling and the swelling is gone. He looked at that mom in amazement. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've heard of miracles, but I've never seen a miracle. That mother began to shout. She began to praise the Lord. She said, I told you, Doc, God's got something special for my boy's life. All I had to do was touch heaven on his behalf you say hoy what became of this little boy his name was Dwight D Eisenhower the 34th president of the United States and the supreme commander of the allied forces of World War II what are you saying hoy I say thank God when God's people pray and touch heaven it moves his hand in his heart and that's what we see here so there's the protection there's the prayer then notice see the peace in verse 6 the Bible tells us the The night before Herod's going to come to have Simon Peter tried. Simon Peter's not wringing his hands. He's not pacing the floors. I said a few weeks ago, he's not even doing anything spiritual like praying. Oh, Luke says, you know what Simon Peter's doing? He's snoozing. He's sleeping. He's chained to a soldier on one hand. He's got another soldier on the other hand. He's not concerned or nervous at all. He had enough peace in his heart to allow him to, to nod off and sleep. I thought, my goodness, wouldn't it be good to have that type of peace in our hearts, in our minds, and we face the things that we see in this world. Well, that brings us to where we want to take up our story tonight. And I want you to see, first of all, tonight, the power in verses 7 through 10. The Bible tells us Peter was asleep, and all of a sudden an angel of the Lord appears next to him. The Bible says a light shone into the cell, but he's in such a deep sleep, he doesn't notice any of it. In fact, he's so out... The Bible says the angel has to hit him, has to smote him on the side to wake him up. He wakes him up and he says, arise up, get up quickly. And at that moment, the chains fall off of Simon Peter. Now, Luke gives us some some details. And to be honest with you, they're a little perplexing. I'm not sure if there's any particular significance in them, but obviously the Holy Spirit 
inspired him to include him. He says in verse 8, the angel told Peter to get his clothes and his sandals on and wrap his cloak or his garment around him. And he follows the angel out of the prison. Verse 9 says he does what the angel instructed him to do. But at this point, he wasn't sure if these things were actually happening or if he was seeing a vision. Now remember, back in Acts chapter 10, God used a vision to communicate to Simon Peter. So Simon Peter thinks, well, is this a vision or is this the real thing? Verse 10 says that as they exited the prison, they passed the first section of guards, they passed the second section of guards, and there was a big iron gate that led into the city. And as Peter and the angel approached the gate, the Bible says it opened to them of its own accord. You know what the Greek word for that is? It was so cool to me. It means automatic. The angel had his own garage door opener is what it was. And as they walk into this gate, it just opens and they walk right out. The implication here is that when they walked out, Simon Peter is free and the angel vanishes. So there's the power. Notice secondly tonight, the perception in verse 11. The Bible says now, when Peter was come to himself, he said, I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jews. Simon Peter said this, hey, this isn't a dream. This isn't a vision. I realize God has delivered me once again. God has given me his grace and his mercy once again. He's not finished with me yet. He's proven again that he's still in charge. He's still in control. He's reminded me again that man's power is no match for his power. You see, Herod wanted Simon Peter dead. And the Jews wanted Simon Peter dead. But they did not have the final say of the matter. Thank God our Heavenly Father did. And the same hold truth tonight. Listen, church, the world is tired of us as Christians. You saw it last week. They're throwing them in jail for standing up for what's right. But I'm here to tell you tonight, brother, I don't care about the power they have. There's one who's still almighty. There's one who's still sovereign. And they don't do anything that he doesn't allow them to do to us. And so he said, hey, I, I recognize what God wants and it's much more powerful than what man wants. And so he, he goes through and he's seen what's taking place there. And, you know, I thought about this, even with that lady getting thrown in jail. I don't know what God has in mind with that situation. I don't know what his purpose is. But you can mark this down, buddy. He's going to get glory out of it one way or another. Even if it's just, he might have just allowed it to happen to light a fire in the people of God. So we'll stand up and start doing something about all this mess going around us. So his power is unmatched. His power is unlimited. Simon Peter said, this is real. God has delivered me once again. Let me say this to you tonight. You ever been in a situation that the world would look at it and say, oh, that's just good luck that happened to you. Or that's just coincidence that happened to you. You stop them right there and say, no, sir, I realize God did this. I realize God is who delivered this. So verse 12 suggests to us that Simon Peter did a little reflecting about all these events. I doubt it was for very long though. He's probably looking over his shoulders the whole time, making sure those guards don't realize what have happened. But he begins to think about what's taken place. And he decides to head over to the house of a woman by the name of Mary. Luke tells us she was John Mark's mother. John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. Some Bible scholars suggest that he was also an acquaintance of Simon Peter from his youth. You know the story about John Mark. He accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but he got discouraged and he deserted them in Perga and old Paul didn't want him to go with them anymore, did he? According to Acts chapter 13. But later he's forgiven by Paul. He's brought back into good grace with them. So, so Simon Peter's headed to the house of Mark's mother. The Bible tells us many Christians had gathered in her home and they were having a prayer meeting. And, and we're under every indication that the focus of the prayer meeting was Peter's imprisonment. That's what they were praying for. They were praying that God would set him free. They were praying that God would spare his life. So there's the power. There's the perception. Notice thirdly the problem tonight, verses 13 through 15. The Bible tells us Peter knocked on the door. One of the servants, servant girls by the name of Rhoda came to answer. And apparently she asked, who is it? And he said, Simon Peter. And when she heard her voice, the Bible tells us she got so excited, she forgot to open the door. Verse 14 says, And when she knew it was Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in 
and told how Peter stood before the gate. So Simon Peter's left standing outside waiting to get in. Warren Wiersbe said God could get Simon Peter out of prison, but Simon Peter couldn't get himself into the prayer meeting. So, so Rhoda runs in to where all the people have gathered, and she says, Simon Peter's at the door. And these people full of faith, you know what they say to her? You're crazy. That's what you are. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says they said unto her, thou art mad. You've lost your mind. Now, now wait a second. A major theme of this entire story in this chapter is about the unceasing prayer of the people of God. And how many of you know there's always a direct correlation between the faith of a prayer and the result of a prayer? But, but what's happening here? Verse, or chapter 15 suggests to me, or verse 15, that this body of believers had just prayed a miraculous prayer, but when it really came down to it, they're a lot like you and I. They didn't believe God was going to answer it. I know they're a lot like you and I, because I'm looking at your faces right now. You're saying, I hope he's not talking to me. Have you ever had God do something miraculous and deep down inside, you didn't really believe he would do it? That's what happened here. The answer to their prayers is standing outside the door, but they don't have the faith enough to open the door and let him in. You say, Hoy, why, why would you bring this up? Let, let, let me explain this. Let me ask you this. Am I the only person in here who's ever struggled with believing that whether or not God is going to answer my prayers was exclusively related to how much faith I had that he was going to do it? Anybody else in here struggle with that? Does that cause any pressure on you? You ever felt that pressure? I mean, you have something major in your life. And as you go through the Gospels, there's times God very specifically, Jesus specifically told people, I read it this afternoon, according to your faith, be it unto you. That puts some pressure in my opinion. But you know what? And I want you to understand this, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. We need to have faith. We need to believe. But when you go through the Gospels, you know what you find out? When Jesus is talking to people about their faith and believing, you know what he's talking about? He's asking them, do you believe I can do it? That's what he's asking them. And if you're like me, my problems with my faith are not, will God or can God do it? Right. Right, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, honest to goodness, I don't believe I've ever come up against anything that I've seen and I've looked at and I've doubted, can God really meet that need? Can God really heal this person? So if you're like me, our problems are not, can God Let's be honest. Our problems are will God. And so I want to say this to you. If you struggle with that, don't let the devil beat you up over that. Don't let the devil beat you up over that. Because let me tell you why. God knows our hearts, brother. He knows our hearts. I read it also today in the book of Mark. They brought that boy with the unclean spirit, that dumb and deaf spirit. And, and, and he brings that, the father brings him to him. And, and you know what the Lord says to him? If you believe it can happen. You know what he said? I believe but help my unbelief. Have you ever been there? Hey, I've been there. We want to believe. We're trying to believe with all of our heart. We'll remember the things he's done in the past, but at the end of the day, buddy, I'm thankful that sometimes God does miraculous things in spite of our lack of faith. And that's what he did right here. These people prayed a miraculous prayer, but they didn't even believe it was going to happen. And God said, I'll just answer it for them anyways, thank God. You know, it's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit to help us when we're struggling with our faith. It's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit when we begin to doubt, we begin to have questions. You know what the Bible says? He is a witness to us. He stands up in our spirit and he says, hey, his promises are true, brother. He does keep his word. So it's not, Lord, a matter if you can do it. We know you can do it. What we struggle is if it's his will to do it. And so that's what happens here. But I thank God there's times that God meets our greatest needs in spite of our lack of faith. You see it here in Acts chapter 12. So these gathered here in Acts 12, that they didn't believe that the Lord had answered their prayer. They told Rhoda she was crazy. But you know what? You got to give it to the gal. She had some spunk in her. The Bible says she constantly affirmed that it was so. You know what those words mean? She kept on insisting. They're telling her, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. She said, no, I'm not. I heard his voice. He's right out there. They're arguing back and forth. And she begins to sway him, but not all the way. They said, well, you might have heard a voice. But then verse 15 says, well, it's probably just his angel. And I read about this this afternoon. 
there was a Jewish superstition that believed each person had his own guardian angel that could assume the person's form. So they didn't believe it was Simon Peter. They thought it was just something else. So there's the, the power, there's the perception, there's the problem. Notice, fourthly tonight, the persistence in verse 16. While God's people are inside arguing over whether or not God had answered their prayer, the actual answer is standing outside knocking on the door. And I imagine by this time, knowing Simon Peter, that knock is getting louder and that knock is getting harder. And there might even be some yelling saying, hey, if you don't open this door, these guards are going to catch me and kill me. And so what happens? Finally, they open the door. The Bible says when they do it, they were astonished. They were amazed. Someone might have said, well, what do you know? The Lord actually did it. And verse 17 tells us that, that when he comes into the house, and no surprise here, all of them got something to say. They're all talking. Probably some of them asking questions. Hopefully some of them were praising the Lord. And so Simon Peter has to quiet them down. The Bible says he silences them and, and, and he begins to share with them how God had miraculously delivered him again. Now they probably already heard the story from Acts chapter 5. And now he's telling them, you know, this time the angel showed up and I slept right through the whole thing. But finally he woke me up and he led me here. And he said, this is what I want y'all to do. I want y'all to go tell James what's taking place. James was the half-brother of Jesus, the head of the Jerusalem church. I want you to go tell James what God has done. And I want you to go tell the brethren what he's done. And I want you to notice the end of verse 17. The Bible says, and he departed and went into another place. Well, where did he go, Hoy? Great question. Many of the Bible scholars, they, they, leave, they, they scratch their heads. They don't know. Because what you have in essence here is you have the beginning of Simon Peter's walk off the pages of Scripture. There are two more major events in Scripture that involve Simon Peter. After this event in Acts 13, his name is only found 11 more times in the Bible, and two of those are when he identifies himself in his epistles. So there's two more major events that happen, one that's found in Galatians 2 and one that's found in Acts chapter 15. From a chronological standpoint, Bible scholars differ. You can find just as many that think Acts 15 happened before Galatians 2 as Galatians 2 did before Acts chapter 15. Wearsby thinks Acts 15 happened first. But I'm not going to really focus on which one happened first. I just want to tell you about what happened at both of those. And that will bring us to the conclusion of Simon Peter's life in the book of Acts. I'm going to start with Galatians chapter 2. In that chapter, to be honest with you, what's recorded about Simon Peter is not very favorable. So that's why I hope that Galatians 2 happened before Acts 15. But knowing Simon Peter may not have been the case. But in Galatians chapter 2, it's not a favorable situation. The Apostle Paul relates an incident in which Simon Peter compromised. He kind of had a relapse. To put it bluntly, he was acting like a hypocrite. And if you recall, after his experience at the house of Cornelius, he began to eat with the Gentiles. He said it's okay for us to fellowship with them as true brothers in Jesus Christ. He even defends his actions as we read a couple weeks ago in Acts chapter 11. Well, at some point in time, he traveled to Antioch. And while he was there, the church was visited by some of the associates of James. Now, now Paul doesn't suggest that James sent these men nor does he suggest they were even officials of the church. But they end up there and they announce themselves as associates of James. And they begin to teach that unless the Gentiles were circumcised and followed Old Testament ceremonial law, they said they should not be recognized as being saved and thus should not be treated as brethren. Now, Simon Peter's already dealt with this at some one point in time in Acts chapter 11. And we're not sure why, but for some reason... He got intimidated by these guys. He got influenced by these guys. And he stopped doing what he told the people in Acts 11 it was okay to do. He stopped eating with the Gentile brethren. When they would invite him to come over, he would make up some excuse. They said it was a very subtle avoidance. But here's what happened. Everybody saw Simon Peter doing it, so they started doing it as well. Why? Because he was their leader. So the Apostle Paul, being the non-confrontational, gentle spirit that he is, 
says, I got to deal with this. And this is what he writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul called Simon Peter on the carpet about this. He said, Peter, you're wrong. He said, you're the one who told the Jerusalem leaders in Acts 11 about your experience when you came back from Cornelius' house. And he said, now you're allowed in these Judaizers, which basically is what they were, to intimidate you. And we don't have any record of how Peter responded. But scripture would indicate that he said, you know what? You're right, Paul. He admitted his sin and he was, was restored back to fellowship once again. In fact, he writes these words in the last verses of his second epistle. He says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So that's the first event that happens outside of Acts chapter 13 that involves Simon Peter. Here's the second one. And once again, it might have happened before Galatians 2, might have happened afterwards. The second event takes place in Acts chapter 15. It's known as the Jerusalem Council. This meeting was called to discuss the very thing that the Judaizers were arguing with them about in Galatians 2. Whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised and follow the requirements of the Mosaic law in order to be considered saved. And when the error of the Judaizers was finally confronted in this meeting that involved the church leaders and the apostles, guess who the first person is to stand up and start the defense of the gospel? There were three people that spoke. James, Paul, and the first one is Simon Peter. This is what he says in verses 7 through 11. The Bible says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, listen to this, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. And so that begins the argument. And after he gets through speaking and Paul and James get through speaking, they agree upon this. They agree that you're right. We should not uh, consider this a requirement for them to be saved. Now, both the confrontation with Paul in Galatians 2 and the Jerusalem council meeting in Acts 15 from a timeline standpoint happened between 48 to 50 AD. So the last 15 years or so of Peter's life, they're somewhat vague. We don't really have anything concrete to go on other than some dates and places in Scripture where his name is mentioned. For example... 1 Corinthians 9, 5 tells us that Simon Peter traveled with his wife and ministered. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 suggested what? That he visited Corinth. We know that his first epistle was written sometime between A.D. 64 or 65. And the second one's com completed shortly before his death, probably around 67 A.D. It's believed he was executed by who? By Nero. 67 or 68. Scripture doesn't record the death of Simon Peter. Eusebius cites the testimony of Clement who says that before Peter was crucified, he was forced to watch the crucifixion of his own wife. As he watched her being led to death, Clement said he called her by name and said this, Remember the Lord. All the ups and downs that Simon Peter had. All the times he failed and all the times he was strong. Buddy, I'm glad he finished well, And when she was done, when she was crucified, and it was time for him to meet his Savior, what did he say to him when they wanted to crucify him? He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. And they granted his request to be crucified upside down. Simon Peter, most of the time when people mention your name, they think of a denial. Most of the time when they mention your name, they think about how you got out and couldn't walk on the water. Simon Peter, they talk about all the mistakes you made. But I want to tell you this tonight, buddy. I admire this fella right here. Because when Jesus was gone and they were looking and he knew the persecution that was coming, 
Thank God he stood up and preached some of the greatest messages we've ever read in the history of the New Testament church. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you've learned something that will challenge you and make us grow in our faith. Would you stand as we get a song of invitation?